true ado, that which you've been waiting all day for, a great, great group of talented people, people that I just got to meet this morning, but that I've already fallen in love with. I hope the Lord will allow our paths to cross time and time again. One of America's most popular gospel singing groups, let's give a big welcome to the Tally Trio.
lunch today. The pastor has a new girlfriend. Come here, Lauren. This is Roger and Debbie's little girl, and she is two and a half years old, and she sings, and uh, she just fell in love with a preacher today for some strange reason. And, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, come here. You want to sing? What do you want to sing? What do you want to sing? Amazing Grace? Thank you. 
churches, we live in holy people. But uh, I've been in Nathan's shoes a lot of times. Many times I've questioned the Lord. I remember when he told us to be a family again, I questioned the Lord then. And the uh, longer I questioned him, the more miserable I became. So here tonight, the Lord's speaking to you, giving you a job to do. Take my advice. Turn loose and do exactly what he wants you to. You won't be happy. You won't get any rest. You won't get any peace of mind. You'll be miserable until you're doing exactly what the Lord wants you to do. I appreciate the message and that song. When we leave this service here tonight, 
them have got beautiful, beautiful voices, and uh, I just really, really enjoy them. I, I, I enjoy being with them too. They're spiritual people, and I like that. I, I just enjoy the kind of treating them. I really do. I want you to stand for just a moment, please. Lisa, will you come to the piano, please? And Keller, will you come to the organ? And Pete, will you come? A young man came to our church and joined our church a little over a year ago. I'll let you stand for a moment. And I fell in love with him. There's not a person in this building that likes gospel music any more than he does. And there's not one more dedicated to the Lord. And uh, he has a desire to be in full-time service, just singing for the Lord. I believe God will fill that desire for him. But I've taken it on to me every time I find anybody around. If I wanted a job at working on cars, I'd get around mechanics. And I'd maybe pull the coil wire and then act real intelligent and find what was wrong and put it back in where they'd say, hey, he's a mechanic. So I took it on me every time we have anybody that's involved in gospel music to come to our church, then I insist that they hear him sing because he's mine and I love him. Van Harris, you come on the platform and we'll let you sing. One of the Italians told me today, they had, when I asked him, said, you ever heard Van sing? And they said, no, we've never heard him sing. Now, we're not trying to compete Van with the Italians by no means. But we love, we've learned to love the Tylers, and we want them to hear our Van Harris sing because he's a good singer, and we love him with all of our heart. Tylers, y'all were such a blessing to me today personally. Thank you for coming, and I hope you come this way quite often. You may be seated. Van Harris will sing. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, and then I'll preach.
pretty. Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints and the hope which is laid up for you in heaven whereof you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day we heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us <clears throat> your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all blessing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And I like verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I'm so thankful tonight that I can stand and bring you the good news of redemption. And that redemption is in none other than a person, Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I'm thankful that God has looked down from heaven before he ever made man and made provision for fallen mankind and redemption is possible for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. We're saved by placing our trust and our faith in none other than Jesus Christ. Salvation is not in turning over a new leaf. It's not in joining the church. It's not in joining some group. But salvation is, is in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Psalms chapter 3 and verse number 8. The psalmist said salvation is of the Lord. In Jonah 2, immediately after the fish that God had prepared spit Jonah out upon the shore, Jonah said salvation belongeth to the Lord. In Acts chapter 4, after a prayer meeting, Paul said, or Peter said this, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is our salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's God's will to save sinners. Peter said God is not willing not slack as some men count slackness, but God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. Friend, God wants you saved. He wants you saved so much until he gave himself, Jesus Christ, that you might have everlasting life. Your sins have been paid for and all you need to do is come to God through Christ for that salvation. And then he'll take your sins and he'll place them behind his back as far as the east is from the west and bury them in the depth of the sea never to be remembered no more. That's what redemption is. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I look the world over today this morning I shared with you that every three seconds 100 folks drop off into hell without Christ where they'll burn forever 
and ever and ever. I wonder what's wrong. I look at the church today, and I'll tell you, you can go to seminars, and they can tell you how to build the church. But I'll tell you, it's not you and I that are building the church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. It's our responsibility to be available. He said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, this body, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, if God is wanting to save men, and God is so willing to save, I do not believe that anyone personally wants to go to hell. Then why is it that so many people are dropping off into hell? I believe there's a failure on mine and your part. And I believe one of those failures tonight is the failure to pray. I said here recently, I've been preaching on Sunday night on prayer. And last Sunday night as I closed the message, I said, how many people actually do not know how to pray? And between 150 and 200 people raised their hand. And I dare say that more should have raised their hands. And there's nothing wrong with that because in the Luke 11, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Next Sunday night, I'll begin a series on how do we pray. But tonight, I want to say a few things about prayer. Tonight, I'd say in the first place that it's right to pray. Jesus prayed. Go to John chapter number 8, and you'll find there the last verse of chapter 7, that the disciples, they went every man into his own house. You know where Jesus went? He went into the mount, and you know what he did? He prayed all night. If God himself prays, then it's right for us to pray. In Luke chapter number 18, or Matthew chapter number 18, there was a lady that came to Jesus. And she continually worried him, and finally he gave her her request. He said this, he said, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Let me say tonight that it's right to pray because our Lord prayed. Paul said this. He said, pray without ceasing. That means that we're to pray at all times, in all places, for all things, because that'll be pleasing to God. Someone said that prayer is talking to God. How we ought to be in our knees praying unto God because as we pray, it pleases God. So I'd say in the first place, number one, it's right to pray because Jesus prayed. Not only that, I find in our text tonight that the great apostle Paul, that he prayed. I do not believe that Paul wrote, for, wrote 14 of the New Testament books. Glenn Williams believes that. But I have the Bible and I have the truth. And I know he didn't write but 13. Someone said, who wrote Hebrews? I'll get into that later on. I believe that God used Paul to write 13 of the New Testament books. And in every one of those books, with the exception of one, he prayed for that church. In the, in a, in the text that we read tonight, he was praying for the church at Colossae. And so Christ prayed, and the great apostle Paul prayed, and not only that, even the Pharisees prayed. Luke chapter number 18 Bible said two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and he prayed, Lord, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. God, thank you that I'm not like the Southern Baptist. Lord, thank you that I'm not like the Presbyterian. Lord, thank you that I'm not like a lot of these independents. Listen, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If we don't quit shooting them down in the front of the line, we're going to lose the battle. It's time that we rise up and come together and 
Just take the word of God and stand on thus, saith the word of God. Pharisee prayed. And he said, I, I'm not like other men. I give tithes of all that I possess. Oh, he was a tither. He said, I fast twice in the week. But oh, the old publican standing afar off would not even lift his eyes toward heaven. And he smote upon his breast. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God said, yonder in heaven, put out on the records, this man is justified. Who oh, I say to you tonight, when we come to him in a humble spirit, seeking God and praising God and lifting up God in prayer, God's pleased with it. And so it's right to pray. Jesus prayed, Paul prayed, the Pharisee prayed, and Peter and John, I find them in Acts chapter number 3. And oh, how that early church moved forward. I find in Acts chapter number 1, there's 120 on the day of Pentecost, you go through there and you'll find that 3,000 were added and then 5,000 men besides women and children and then a multitude and then they were multiplied. But you find the early church praying. We're failing. And our failure today is not an educational failure. Our failure today is not an organizational failure. Our failure today is not a theological failure. Our number one failure today is a failure to pray. Paul said, pray always. So listen to me tonight. It's right to pray. Peter and John prayed. Yeah, I, I, Jesus prayed. Paul prayed. The Pharisee prayed. And you go to the Old Testament, and you'll find there that Abraham prayed for Lot. I mean, this book is a book of prayer. You take this book and you hide it in your heart. And this book will make you want to talk to the author. Oh, how we need to pray. And I believe the more we read this book, the more we want to pray. Prayer is not a natural thing. Men don't just naturally pray. I've had people say, oh, I just automatically pray every day. Well, the next time you get alone with God, you need to confess your sin there and have him to forgive you part because there's no such thing as a natural prayer. We have to work at it. And so it doesn't come naturally, but it's right for us to pray. And so I see Abraham prayed for Lot. Cornelius play, prayed in the Old Testament. Not only that, but the church prayed for Peter and God opened the cell doors and God took the chains off of Peter. And God helped the guards and blindfolded them while Peter walked out. And Peter went to the prayer meeting and knocked on the door. And they didn't even believe it was him. They wouldn't let him in. And not the average church today. If we pray and get an answer to our prayer, we say, oh, something strange going on around here. But let me say to you tonight, it's right to pray. Okay, if it's right to pray, what should we pray for? Well, in the first place, we ought to be thankful. Look in verse 3 of our text tonight. We give thanks to God. Look again in verse number 12 where he said, giving thanks unto the Father. Listen, I'll tell you, we're living in an ungrateful world. You realize the sin of ingratitude precedes the sin of unholiness? This nor the last day, or the, no also in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, proud boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. The reason we've got an unholy generation tonight is because we've had an unthankful generation. The first thing we ought to do is thank God. Just give him thanks. Thank him for what he's done. Thank him for what he's going to do. Thank him for what he's doing. Just be grateful to God. Oh, somebody said, well, said, when I began to pray, he said, I run out of anything to pray for. Have you ever thought about just praising God? I mean, how do you do that? Thank him for, <laughs> you know, this old body we live in. I thank God for this human body, don't you? A God that could make a human body as meticulous and finite as it is. Listen to me tonight. He's younger for 2,000 years preparing heaven. What's heaven going to be like? Whoo! I can't hardly wait to get there. It's going to be good. Just thank him for man. The psalmist said, 
Psalms 129, 14. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'll praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. On a wall in the Library of Congress, this inscription is found. There's but one temple in the universe, and that is the body of man. I mean, just thank God for man. I like to hear Gerald Bucos pray when he gets up here. I'll tell you, he gets in that voice, and I believe the angels in glory pull the Venetian blinds and raise the window a little bit where it can get in when he begins to pray. And one of the first things he said is, thank you, God, for God. How long has it been since you just thank God for God? I mean, just clear you off of space and have a spell. You get to thanking God and get grateful. The first thing you know, God will start blessing you. And so just thank him for man. No wonder Carlisle said, whoso layeth hand, his hand on a human body toucheth heaven. Shakespeare said concerning man, what a piece of work is man. Ever thought about man, how God made him? What? That piano over there has got 88 keys on it. Look at the little old human ear. It can, it's got more than 1,500 different vibrations. So wonderfully made that you can hear the blood running through your vessels. I mean, outside of the ear is capable of catching 73,700 vibrations a second. Whoo, God made that ear. Just thank God for it. Ever thought about the eyes? The eyes are telescopes and microscopes. You can gaze at the sun a million miles away and also focus on the point of a pen. God made it. Don't have to ask where it come from. God made it. I'll tell you, these nuts going around today say, oh, you know, man came from a monkey. I once was a tadpole, long and thin. Then I was a bullfrog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey hanging from the tree. Now I'm a professor with a PhD. Hmm? Ain't none of my kin folks ever hung from their tail. Floyd, a couple of them hung from their neck, but none from their tail. And if you believe in that junk, you know your kin folks better than I do. I mean, you ever thought about the feet? The foot contains 26 bones. Not one of those bones is any wider than your thumb. It's so arched and constructed with ligaments and tendons and muscles and joint that a person weighing 400 pounds can put all of his weight on those bones and they'll not break. Whoo! God made it. Thank God for that. I mean, you ever thought about the heart? I mean, they cut it out today. Heart's about the size of your fist. It beats 4,320 times an hour, 100,000 times a day, 40 million times a year. A drop of blood can make a round trip through the circulatory system in 22 seconds. God made it. How long has it been since you thanked him? Oh, you think about it. Man. Inflation here. Donald Furman says that the chemicals in the body would cost $5.65 in a person weighing 150 pounds. $3.50 in 1969 and 98 cents in 1936. So in 1936, Martinez, she was worth 98 cents. Hmm? He took all those molecules and those chemicals and put them together, and here he is. God made it. God made man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life and man became a living soul. Woman said, I don't understand that. I said, oh, still I'll explain it. I said, God took a roll of clay and he rolled it up and he fashioned it and he patted it around here and there and he stuck some eyes in and he slid a mouth out. And he said, then he made a note punched a hole in this side and he punched a hole into this side and he breathed into it the breath of life and man became a living soul. Hallelujah! That's where we come from. You ever thought what it costs to breathe air? One breathes 18 times a minute, 25,920 times a day, 
The hospital said it cost $10,000 a year for the continuous use of oxygen. That's $700,000 for 70 years. And God give it to you free. Hang on, I'm going to get to you in a minute. The cost of sunlight, it takes 1,750 watts an hour to light a six-room house. Multiplying the wattage by 100 to arrive at the intensity of the sun, it had cost over a million dollars for a period of 70 years. Hmm? You ever thought about prayer? Huh? Mr. Bell's going up, hadn't he? We got Sprint and Lent and Tent and all them kinds. Three phone calls at